We're always doing crazy stuff in this kitchen. I feel like every day it's something different. And then I have to wake up the next day and try to up what we did the day before. And sometimes, I'll be honest, that can be really hard. I'm always trying to find that balance between making a bunch of food that people can just take home and make themselves, and also find that crazy food, that food that no one's really ever seen before. I wanna show people new things, take people through new experiences with food. And that's why we put in a lot of work to the video today. We've gotten something that up until pretty recently, it was really hard to ship from Spain to the United States. Just to my side here, we have something very, very, very special. In fact, it's sort of the national treasure of Spain. You've all heard of ham, you've all heard of prosciutto, but how about jamón ibérico? And we're not gonna stop there. It's not just any jamón ibérico. It's Cinco Jotas jamón ibérico. Five star, the best of the best. Cinco Jotas jamón ibérico is the top of the line when it comes to jamón ibérico. It truly is the holy grail of all hamdom, if that even makes sense. I'm not gonna make you wait because I'm just as excited as you are to open this thing up. So let's bring it on in. Nope, it's not a guitar. It's not a weapon either. It's the best ham in the world. Now this beauty right here is from La Tienda, which imports incredible products from all across Spain and beyond. What you're looking at right here is the most exclusive ham in the entire world. There's no better way to say it. This is a product of feeding pigs three kilograms of acorns per day. That's an insane amount. And all those acorns have flavor. It's expensive to feed pigs that many acorns. To start things out, let's open it up. I love that it comes in such a fancy case here. Even the zipper says 5J on it, Cinco Jotas. And there are even a couple acorns next to the J, which is pretty cool. Now I'll gently take this thing out of its casing. We got a little rope in there too, but we don't need that for now. And it looks like there's a little certificate inside. Cinco Jotas Pata Negra Iberico Ham has come to be regarded as Spain's national treasure, remaining true to its artisan tradition and ensuring only the highest quality since 1879. As for the actual ham itself, this thing is enormous. It seems like it's about 13 to 15 pounds or so. And what we have here comes from the hind limb of the Iberian pig. That's the best part. What you're looking at right here would run you about 1500 bucks. And it makes total sense. Generally, the more time it takes to produce something, the more it's gonna cost you. These are completely amazing all the way from the beginning. Their genetic makeup, their breed, food, environment, water, everything is superior in every single way. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to cut this thing open. So let's go. Now to open this thing up, I'm just gonna start by gently cutting through the plastic that it comes in. Once this is open, there's really no going back. The fat is mainly gonna be what protects this. Now right away, I'm hit with that insane nutty aroma. And I have to say, it kind of does already smell like acorns. You can probably tell how fatty this thing is. And many people are surprised to know that all the the fat in here is actually fairly healthy for you. These are so high in oleic acid that they're often called walking olive trees. And that fat actually has a similar color to olive oil. Using a paper towel to take this out because of how fatty it is, I'll lift the whole thing up and lay it on top of my plastic. Then I'll peel back this additional piece of plastic to reveal what is an amazing looking leg. Now before I do anything, I wanna quickly lift this up and just let you take a look at it. Again, you can see the Cinco Hotas tag right here. The best of the best. If I even leave my hand here for just a few moments, it'll immediately get coated in all of that fat. And that right there is precious fat. Temperature is very important when you go to eat this, and we'll talk about that later. But I don't want to touch it too much right now because all that fat will melt onto my hand and not in my mouth. Now we're going to be doing something pretty unique here. We'll be slicing this the traditional way. So I'll move my jamón to the side and get rid of my cutting board for now. Now here, I'll place down a traditional carving stand. I'm not kidding when I say that we're sticking with tradition here. I'll lift up my giant leg and then fit it right into the stand. Once I fit it through that back end there, I'm gonna tighten this piece right here. If you look really closely right here, you'll notice that the knob that spins this in is actually an acorn. The acorns that they feed these pigs are a bit longer than the ones I've seen in the past. So this is just yet another detail on here that shows you how truly dedicated to this incredible piece of meat people in Spain really are. Once I've gotten this as tight as I can such that this won't shake around as I carve it, you can see that the jamón is nice and secure right in my stand here. When carving our jamón, it's best to start with the shank. To do this, we need three knives. One for the rind, which I'll use my a chef's knife to take care of, then something to separate bones, for which I'll be using a boning knife, and finally, my favorite, a jamonero knife. This is somewhat like a fillet knife, long and flexible, and able to get those nice thin slices of the ham. Let's get started. To start, I'll go about two fingers off of this bone right here, which is pretty easy to find. Then, I'll come in with my chef's knife and go about as far down as I can get. At this point, I'll start taking off some of that fat, but keep in mind, we wanna save this fat, because if we don't go through our whole jamón today, this can be laid back down down on top to cover and preserve that meat. I'll continue slicing off pieces of that fat until I start to reach the meat. This fat smells incredible. And I'm actually starting to see some of the meat, so it looks like I'm getting there. But again, I'm not quite there yet. When I finally come down the line right here, I can see some of the jamón, which gets me very excited. Keep in mind, with all these
these pieces that I'm cutting off this rind, I'm gonna save these. None of this goes to waste. In fact, for a piece like this where we have some of that meat there, you'll see what I'm gonna use this for later. When we finally start getting down to the spot where you can really carve, there's just fat pouring off the sides of this thing. Once we've properly trimmed off the fat on this first section, we're ready to slice. Note that there are four different flavors, four different aromas in any given jamon. We're starting here with this top part, where I'll come with my slicing knife and without applying any pressure, gently wiggle back and forth until I get a nice piece. Now, I know that's not the most perfect piece ever, but cut me some slack, that's my first cut. I'll lay these aside on my cutting board to be able to use for several of our recipes. I'll come back again and gently slide from side to side until I get a nice piece of the jamon. I'm sure practice makes perfect with this, but it's really, really fun. I think this will take me a little time to get the hang of it, but eventually I hope to get nice, clean cuts. This one looks a little bit better overall. I still know that I need to get thinner. Keeping even pressure across the whole blade of the knife, I'll just gently slide back and forth. Now I'm starting to get nice, thinner pieces. And at this point, I just want to get them square and even. While getting overly excited about what I think is my first good cut of meat, I know there's a little breakage there, but this is a rather see-through and clean cut, squared off piece. I seem to have forgotten something. Rumor has it these jamon are treated so incredibly well, there's a fly flying around the apartment and we do not like that. You got him? You did? Yeah. Oh! Wow. Back to it though, it appears that these are treated so incredibly well that they're actually serenaded with Mozart before passing away. And to kill them, they use carbon dioxide to do it very gently and calmly so that that doesn't affect the meat. You don't want an animal tensing up or doing anything like that before you go to take this incredible meat that you spent so long building up with these acorns. So before cutting into it any further, I do want to give it a bit of Mozart. I think this is a pretty good amount of Mozart that we just played, but I think we should also go play it for the fly over there that just perished. I'll be right back. Our next step will be to cut down here near the bone, because again, we need to be able to cut up against this bone right here, just like we've made this cut down here to be able to cut and have the hormone release. I just want to show you that when I say how fatty this is, I mean it. Check out this little portion here where there seems to be an actual pocket of this fat. I'm just going to push down for a second and watch all that come right out of there. I can even squeeze it, which I don't want to do too much, but just look at all that fat. I could dip bread in this and it would almost be like dipping bread in a beautiful thing of olive oil. It's just amazing how much natural healthy fat there is in this hummel. Once we've made the incision right up against this other bone, we can then return to making those nice clean cuts. You can see that my skill levels are improving a bit, but again, I still need a little bit of practice. I am finding that if you just keep really nice even pressure on the knife and make very, very slow cuts back and forth, it makes it a lot easier for an amateur like myself to get some clean cuts. Like with this piece, right here. I've gotten that really nice, small, almost square-like piece that we're looking for. And you can also see that it's pretty thin. Now, like I said, there are many parts to this jamon right here, and I could continue cutting for an hour or so to basically cut through the entire thing. But I think we want to make some stuff with it. And I know you're probably dying to hear what this tastes like if you haven't had it before. So I'll try to make a few more professional cuts, and I will say it looks like this one right here could be a good one. Not too bad. Still a couple holes in the middle, but not too bad. And then momentarily, we're going to taste this whole thing. As you can see, when we carve, we get these really, really nice ridges that show up on each piece of jamon from those tiny little knife cuts that we give. You should be able to see your knife the entire time when cutting through. The fact that I can read all the writing on there is a great sign. Then we lift up our piece. Still getting better. When I can see the sunlight through each piece, I know that I've made a nice clean cut. It really does take a lot of focus and patience when you're cutting back and forth so slowly here. But each individual piece that you eat is so incredibly rewarding that you don't have time to stop and think about that. It's actually kind of a piece process cutting through this. I'm really starting to enjoy it. With this last piece right here, I'm really happy. I'll show you my tray of cut jamon and then we'll cook. Now that we've finished slicing our jamon for now, I'll layer these fat pieces right back onto where we've cut. This should really help to keep everything nice and fresh. And that way, when we come back to eat more of it later, all of those oils and all that amazing flavor should remain well locked up inside our jamon. After I've placed all that fat, I'll lightly lay some plastic wrap over the top so it all stays in place. And then I can rest this beauty aside. Thank you, Hamon. What you can see here now are two different things. First, we have some fat, and more importantly, some scraps that I'm gonna use to make our entree. Cause I'm gonna try to make three dishes with all of this, and they're gonna be insane. The pieces over here that I can't really use to just eat plain, sort of remind me of guanciale, which would be used to make spaghetti carbonara. I'm gonna cut those into small pieces and essentially use those to make a carbonara. But this is gonna be a heck of a lot better than your run of the mill carbonara. Then over here, you can see the whole tray of the carvings I've made. I actually think that for a first timer, I've done okay. Sure. 
they're not perfect, but most of them are pretty thin and they definitely look appetizing to me. They also have a really nice balance of fat to meat and that ratio is really important because you want both. To start, let's eat a little piece. Now with Hamon Iberico, it's very important that you let this come to temperature so that you can really taste all those flavors. Now I'm just gonna lay this down on my tongue and let it sit. Holy cow. Holy pig, I should say. The first thing that comes to mind there is if this tastes this good, what the heck does regular prosciutto taste like? I mean, seriously, this is levels above anything I've ever had like this. This practically makes Wagyu fly out the window. This is insane. And the weirdest part about it is that I think it's really addicting. I could gobble up this entire tray in no time. It's rich, it's nutty, it's so aromatic, it's buttery, you almost get a little bit of that acorn, and it's just this super charged, super fresh prosciutto flavor. This right here is something special. The fats run around your entire mouth and coat everything, and that flavor lasts for a long while after. When I eat a piece of Wagyu or something else that's really fancy like this, I don't necessarily beg, beg, beg for more. And with this, I just keep looking down and wanting to go back for the next bite. Now I could definitely taste this next to regular prosciutto, which I have here, but I have a little special guest who's gonna do that for us. On this side here, we have regular prosciutto, just from the supermarket right up the road. And on this side here, we have jamon iberico. You can already tell it's got that brighter, more vibrant color, but maybe you already guessed who our special judge is going to be. That's right, it's pesto. It's pesto. Now pesto is going to start right in the middle of the board and he's going to run wherever he wants. Here goes. Oh, he's turning towards the jamon. Oh, that's my freaking boy right there. Yes, it is Cinco Jotas. I would not feed you regular prosciutto. Oh, oh my gosh. You heard it here first. Pesto also prefers the jamon iberico over the regular prosciutto. I think he's offended that he's even sitting on the same board as this. Now, I don't want him to eat the whole piece, so I'm gonna try to pull this away, but he doesn't seem to want to let it go. I mean, Pesto is really in love with this jamon. The funniest part for this poor guy is that he was only $9 because he was on sale off of $12, and he's eating a piece of jamon that's probably worth more than he was. But nothing is worth more than Pesto, not even this amazing piece of jamon iberico. He's the cutest guy out there. It's Pesto. And he's taught me almost everything I I know in the kitchen. It's time to go back to your cage, Pesto. Thank you for judging. We're gonna start by making pan con tomate. I've made this in the past, but we're gonna step it up just a little bit by adding some fresh slices of jamon iberico. I'll start here by making a little bit of focaccia because it's a really easy homemade bread to make and it tastes fantastic. I'll start with a cup of warm water, about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Then while whisking, I'll pour in two and a quarter teaspoons of active dry yeast. And finally, just a little drizzle of honey. Once I've whisked this well and let it combine, I'll let this sit for about 10 minutes for the yeast to activate. Now to make our focaccia, we'll add about two and a half cups of all-purpose flour, followed by about a quarter cup of olive oil. Then while mixing, I'll add about another cup of flour until it really firms up. Then knead this until it makes a nice ball of dough. Once that's been well mixed, lift up your mixing bowl and take out that nice big ball of dough. I'll knead this just a few times on my cutting board, then take a nice greased bowl, toss in my dough, and cover it with a damp towel to rise for an hour. Now we'll take a head of garlic and chop off the top. I don't need this section. For pan con tomate, you rub some garlic and then some tomato on the bread. But I like to roast the garlic first to get a nicer flavor out of it. I'll place this whole head of garlic inside a ramekin, then pretty much cover the whole thing with olive oil. What we're basically making here is a garlic confit that we're then gonna just gently rub over the top of our bread to get that nice garlic paste. I'll finish that off with just a little bit of flaky salt on top and then some fresh cracked pepper. Now this will go in the oven at 350 until it's roasted and nice and tender. When that garlic is done, trust me when I say that your entire kitchen is gonna smell incredible. Just look at that sizzle and Please try to tell me that you'd rather have just a plain old piece of raw garlic rubbed on a piece of bread as opposed to that. And do you see how easy that was to make? Little trick, if you're ever having a dinner party, toss some of this in the oven with some olive oil, salt, and pepper just the way I did it and let that cook. Whatever guests you have coming in are gonna think they're about to be blown away whether or not you've made good food, which of course is up to you. Now that we have this infused oil and roasted garlic, we'll prepare our focaccia for the oven. Once we've let our focaccia rest, let's take off our wet towel. Now to start, we'll punch down our dough. You don't want to be too aggressive here, but you do want to let a little bit of that air out. Next, I'm going to bring over the sheet that I'm going to bake this in. You can also use a large flat sheet tray if you'd like. We'll use our roasted garlic to oil the bottom just a little bit at first. Then I'll drop in my focaccia. Move that oil around just a little bit. Then begin to press out your focaccia to take up the whole bottom space of the pan if possible. At this point in time, before seasoning the top of my focaccia, I like to let it rest for about another half an hour. This will just help it rise a little bit more and give a slightly fluffier final product. Now to finish off our focaccia, I'll take off my towel 
Layer some of that garlic olive oil right over the top. Hit it with a nice little sprinkle of black flaky salt. And then just pick a few herbs over the top, just to get a little spice in there. Then we'll bake this for about 15 to 20 minutes or so at 425 Fahrenheit until golden brown. Now at this point, our focaccia should be finished. It's got that beautiful golden brown crust on there. I'm usually not very good for waiting for things to finish. And I also just wanna show you the back of that focaccia. Look at how sexy that is. I'll lay this flat down on my cutting board for just a moment, spin it around to the side, and listen to that nice crust. Then I'll crunch through it with my knife. Again, I'm not good at waiting. What we have here is a flaky, buttery, delicious focaccia. I'm gonna cut out a large piece for us to eat with. The rest, I'll leave on a wire rack to cool. To start, let me rub on our garlic. Just to give you a nice close look, look at that. That right there is one of the best things that a home cook can make easily at home. I'm not kidding. Now I'll dip that in the olive oil, give it a little squeeze to wake up some of that garlic, and then mush it right gently over the top of our bread. That should release some of that garlic confit, while also just giving this bread a general garlicky flavor. Use it almost as a paintbrush here, dipping it back in again, and giving another little brush to make sure it's covered evenly. Now for our tomatoes. We only really need one to rub on there, but I always like color in cooking. I'm gonna find the one that's sort of the softest because that'll help us to kind of rub on there and get some of the juice. It looks like the yellow one. So I'll slice off a few pieces, squish this up to get some of the juices flowing, and again, just gently rub it across our bread. I know it seems like sort of a weird recipe, but it's really, really tasty. Let me get a little bit of that red tomato too, which is quite beautiful, I will say, just in case they have slightly different flavors. Now, of course, to finish this off, we'll put what we've come here today to watch, our jamon iberico. I'll lay just a few slabs lightly over this focaccia, covering up everything. Here, I've picked out the squarest and thinnest slabs that I was able to cut. I need a little more practice, but like I said earlier, this isn't bad for a first timer. And there you have it right here. Pan con tomate with some jamón iberico on top and roasted garlic, all served over a beautiful piece of focaccia, almost like a pizza. To start our carbonara, we're gonna make a few jamón chips. This is very simple. We'll lay down a number of our pieces and we're essentially gonna bake them until they get really nice and crispy. This is just a really good way to get something almost like a Parmesan crisp, but instead it's gonna be a heck of a lot better. I'm gonna mix in a few pieces of that prosciutto that I fed pesto, cause I don't wanna let that go to waste. Once I've evenly spaced out all of my chips, I'm gonna bake them in the oven at about 350 Fahrenheit until they're rigid and crispy. Just a few minutes later, our jamon chips should be done. As long as you hear that nice sizzle, they're all set. I feel like Iron Man with this glove. Now to actually make the pasta dough for our carbonara, we're gonna use the same mixer setup. I know normally I like to use the quote unquote traditional Italian grandma method and put it right down on the cutting board. But today, I've already dirtied these dishes, so let's just keep using them. To start, I'm gonna add in two cups of all-purpose flour. You can use double zero flour if you have it, but I like to use all-purpose because I know most people probably don't find double zero flour in their traditional market. Next, I'm gonna use three whole eggs and two yolks. So I'll start by cracking in the three eggs, one by one, making sure not to get any shells in there. And I got a shell in there. After I've cracked in my three eggs, I'll separate out my two yolks. Finish this off with about one or two tablespoons of olive oil. Then I'll close down my mixer and let it do all the work today. I've earned my break. Once that pasta dough is a nice ball, I'm gonna turn this off, lift this up, and bundle it all together. Once you've gotten that really nice ball of pasta dough, we're gonna wrap it up. Sorry, pasta dough. I'll take some plastic wrap, cover the whole thing up, and place this in the fridge for about 20 minutes until it's gotten time to relax and rest a little bit. Be right back. Once you've taken our pasta out of the fridge, I'll sit this down for a minute. I'll place on my pasta attachment, and with half a piece of my pasta, I'll press it down to prepare it to feed through. As always, I wanna really generously flour my whole machine. Not this part of the machine, just this part. And now once it's well floured, I'll let it run. Once that whole first part has gone through, I'll fold it back over itself and place it through again to get out any air bubbles. You really wanna make sure you have smooth, perfect pasta dough. We wanna slowly build this up such that the pasta has time to get used to getting thinned out. Eventually, once our pasta is thin enough, we can switch on our second forming head to get the other shape we're looking for. I'll add in my second head that'll allow me to make fettuccine. Then I'll take my whole sheet of pasta and prepare it to go through the machine. Make sure that it's layered out really well so that it can easily feed through the pasta head. Once we're ready, we turn it on and go. As we slowly feed this through, I'll take a pair of scissors and cut every time we get to our right length. This right here is a perfect bunch of fettuccine and we'll twist it up and let it sit for cooking. It's sort of like giving somebody a haircut. Instead of guanciale for our carbonara, we're gonna use these cuts here. These are those scraps from the homon iberico that we cut off. I'm just gonna cut these into some nice chunks, which will get really crispy and provide unparalleled flavor in this carbonara. Note that I'm also leaving a decent amount of fat on this, particularly because this is some of the most special fat you'll ever have. Once we've got a nice handful of our homon scraps, let's start searing these off. First, we'll add our jamon scraps, then move these around to render off some of that fat. Do this over medium low so that you don't burn anything. 
Your goal here is to get some of that meat crispy while basically melting off all that fat to be used in the sauce of your pasta. At first, this fat's gonna turn quite translucent and ultimately melt almost all the way off while leaving a crispy, crispy piece of meat. You're gonna do this for about three minutes. Once this is done, we'll set it aside. Now to a small bowl, we'll crack in four eggs making sure that they're all the freshest eggs we can find, and then grate in about a full cup of Parmesan cheese. Typically with carbonara, you can use an even mix between Parmesan and Pecorino, but I'm just gonna use Parmesan here to keep it simple. Oh, but Nick, it's not traditional. It doesn't have to be traditional. I feel like I'm gonna be grating for quite a while here. Once I've grated about a cup of the Parmesan, making sure I save a little bit to grate on the final dish, I'll whisk this up until it's well combined. Then we'll set this aside as well. I'll start by adding a bunch of salt to my pasta water. As always, Sorry about that. As always, we want to salt our water like the ocean. Once that's nice and well salted, I'll plunge in my pasta and just savor this moment because this is always one of my favorite things to watch. When that goes in, I like to swirl the water to make sure the pasta doesn't stick together. So just get that going in a nice little whirlpool for a moment. Then cook it until it floats. Once our pasta is done cooking, we'll take a bowl and scoop out a nice serving of this treasured pasta water. Ah, God. Then we can strain this. We're done with the rest of the pasta water for now. To finish off our carbonara, let's first heat back up our jamon. Once it gets slightly smoky, we'll bring back in our pasta water that burned my hand and pour in between a quarter and a half a cup. Stir this around just a moment to get it nice and hot, then add back in all that pasta. At this point, you really just wanna gently stir this around until there's not much water left. But you can keep this just over high heat to make sure that that water still stays warm and gets absorbed by that pasta. Once nearly all of that water is gone, we'll take that mixture of cheese and eggs and pour it right over the pasta. Now immediately remove this from the heat. Stir constantly to let those eggs thicken up a little bit, and along with that cheese, it'll make a beautiful sauce. Taking this off the heat allows us to cook this to the perfect temperature with that residual heat left over in our warm pan. When it looks great, I always like to just add a little bit more Parmesan cheese because Parmesan cheese really makes everything amazing. And then a key step to finishing off a good carbonara is to add some fresh cracked pepper. Some people put a little bit too much pepper for my taste, but season it however you feel necessary. After that, finish stirring it up one last time, give it a little taste to make sure you've nailed that seasoning and your carbonara is complete. This is a creamy, incredible pasta. One that I promise will absolutely blow your mind. For what I'm gonna call our dessert, but we can definitely call Call it a savory dessert. We're gonna make the jamon iberico version of bacon wrapped dates. I absolutely despise dates. I really just don't like them that much. I don't know what it is. They just sort of taste mealy to me. Almost like when you get a bad apple. But when you wrap them in delicious fat and then put a bit of blue cheese inside, it makes for an incredible little bite to close out a meal. So I'm very simply just gonna take my paring knife and cut right through these dates to cut out the pit. I'll break this open and then gently wedge out that pit, just like that. Before filling them with some of this nice hunk of blue cheese, I'm just gonna take the pit out of a bunch of them. Once I've pitted a bunch of our dates, I'll move this off to the side, gather these up and bring in my baking sheet. I'll line this with just a bit of parchment paper and then lay the dates all over it. Then picking off small little pieces with my fingers, I'll place a little blue cheese inside each date and then close them up. Again, I'll do the same thing with all of my dates. You can pack as much or as little blue cheese inside here. Oftentimes I've seen people put an almond inside and that works really well too, but I just like blue cheese better for a really nice balance of sweet and savory. Once I've added my cheese, I'll then just take some jamon and wrap it around these dates. This one right here is ready to bake. And I'm telling you right now, it is so good. If the jamon doesn't fit all the way around, I'll just drape it over the top. As long as we get a nice shell of the jamon on each piece here, we are totally good. Once we've wrapped up all the jamon, this is ready to bake in the oven, again at 350 until they're golden brown and look delicious. Once those dates are crispy and crackly, slide them on out of the oven. At the risk of burning the heck out of my hand, I just wanna show you how incredible these are. On top, you have that really crispy jamon. Then out of this is dripping this beautiful, beautiful blue cheese, as you can see it dropping off. And then of course, a really hot date. I'll lift a few of these off onto my plate, and then I think it's time to do what we came here to do, taste everything. I always like to tie all my ingredients back to where they started. So I'll finish each of these three off with something that'll help complete the dish. We used honey in our focaccia dough. So I'm gonna put a really light drizzle of honey across this whole piece here. And then this is ready to eat. Next, on our carbonara, I'll do just a little bit more shaved Parmesan across it because Parmesan always makes a good pasta dish. And last but not least, I'll just put a little speck of flaky salt atop each of these little bits here. The homone is already very salty as it is, but having a little flake up top of the roof of your mouth as you bite into it is a really tasty little treat. And now we're ready to feast. Now first for this beautiful bad boy. Sitting on top of that hot focaccia, all that fat has slowly started to melt. As you can see, this piece right here is about as see-through as it can possibly be. I'm just gonna go for it and take a bite here. Mmm. 
Mm, the honey definitely helps to wrap up that whole dish. The focaccia is slightly crispy on the outside and so, so soft on the inside. It's light, it's airy, it's amazing. And that garlic, that garlic takes it to a whole nother level. I don't totally taste a ton of the tomato, but I actually think the tomato serves as a really cool way to just moisten things up a little bit. Kind of get it nice and soft and chewy under there. That right there is a fantastic appetizer. And with the honey on top for that added little bit of sweetness, that'll lube up just about anybody before a meal. Next, we have our carbonara, which looks absurd. And I'm not gonna think too hard about it. I'm just gonna do it. There's something special about that carbonara and I'll tell you why. When you make carbonara, you melt all the fat out of that guanciale and that fat essentially provides all that flavor when you go to make that sauce. So it makes total sense that you'd wanna use an incredible type of fat to make that. And just like I thought, that nutty, acorny flavor comes right out of there the second you take a bite of this carbonara. The pasta's still soft, the Parmesan's still salty and delicious. That egg is made a really thick and velvety sauce on there. So, so creamy without any cream. But it just goes to show you that those ingredients building the foundation of your dish are what makes the whole thing work. Unbelievable. We also have to taste one of these crispy bits on the side of this. Something about these makes them one of my favorite snacks ever. It's insane. It's salty and delicious, almost like a Parmesan crisp, but better. And having that crispiness provides a lot of good texture for the carbonara as a whole. And that brings me to our final thing today, our jamon wrap dates. This I treat as a dessert because it's so incredibly special all in one bite. Eating this at the end of the night would make me a very happy person after a meal. So let's just go for it. Mm. Mm. This bite is totally different from anything else we've just tasted. And it actually makes me laugh a little bit because it totally makes sense that the easiest dish to make would end up being my favorite. And I totally understand why. It's earthy, it's chewy, and it's delicious. It's basically got three simple layers in there. Your blue cheese on the inside, which gives that cream and that really unique, almost moldy taste. The good kind of mold, of course. Then you got that date, which gives that really chewy and soft foundation for the whole bite. And of course, that crispy, delicious stuff on the outside is just perfect. That is incredible. If you don't want to buy Homo Iberico, just go buy some prosciutto and make these dates. Use bacon. Anything is good with these and they are incredible and so, so simple. Finally, we've reached the end. I do really hope you've enjoyed this whole video. It has definitely been quite the journey. Jamon Iberico Cinco Hotas is truly something special, something out of this world. If you have the opportunity to try it, I would absolutely try it. And if you liked any or all of these dishes, try to make them at home. If you want to just go make the focaccia, go for it. It's easy. If I made all of this stuff in a couple hours, you can definitely take elements of that and make a fantastic meal for yourself, your friends, your family, whatever. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for always watching the videos. Please don't forget to like the video because we love getting those likes up. And don't forget to subscribe. We also have so many people that are part of the notifications gang, which is very, very exciting. And we've passed 1.5 million, which is insane. I obviously don't need to tell you that I got quite a lot of food to finish today, so I'll see you next time.